It's my real pleasure to introduce to you Gabrielle Pfister. You, of course, most of you know her. She's going to talk about a large field campaign that took place uh, in Colorado called Frappe, the focus being on air quality research as a key to addressing societal needs. So Gabby will, I think, um, report on the scientific accomplishments that followed those, this campaign. And I think she'll give us a little bit of her vision about, from there, how a place like ACOM and others could be uh, making further progress in the future. So, Gabby. Thank you very much, Guy. Let me know if you have any troubles hearing me or if I'm too loud. I sometimes hear I have too loud a voice. Then I'll try to not yell at you. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm really excited to talk about one of the projects that's really been closest and dearest to my heart, and that's Frappé. But before we go really any further into Frappé, I don't really think I need to tell any of you in the room here why we are interested in looking at air quality and why it's important. But still, the motivation has to be, it is one of the major threats to society impacting human health as well as our ecosystems. Air pollution causes millions of premature deaths. It's a global problem. Uh, mostly impacted our areas in Asia, also in Africa, but also here in the US, we are still experience problems. So when we talk about air pollution, what do we really talk about? We talk about a lot of things that are being emitted into the atmosphere from anthropogenic sources from natural sources that interact in the atmosphere and they call, uh, cause pollution. Mostly when we talk about pollutants, we talk about this, these six criteria pollutants. Carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, lead, ozone, particulate matter. All of them have negative health effects and in the US they are regulated by the Clean Air Act. Frequently one of one or more of these can occur together, and some come from the same sources and others not. In this talk, I mostly focus on ozone, so I really will not touch much on any of the other ones, unless they're important for ozone. And when we talk about ozone, specifically also we need to make a distinction between two different types of pollutants. Primary pollutants that are directly released from a source into the air, so particles are, most of the particles are parts of this category. And you can imagine the largest impact is right next to the source because that's where they come out and then they get diluted or chemically processed. Secondary pollutants such as ozone. Ozone is not directly emitted. Ozone is created in the atmosphere from what we call precursor emissions. So emissions get into the atmosphere and in the atmosphere they chemically react and produce ozone. So the impacts might be larger away from the sources. So it's way harder to put this source and impact relationship together. Ozone chemistry is very complex. And that's actually only showing a little bit of the complexity here. And what you really need to remember is you need three ingredients in order to make ozone in the atmosphere. You need emissions of ozone precursors, nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and you need sunlight to kick off the photochemistry. And then you create ozone. So keep that in mind, NOx and VOCs, they really control how much ozone is in the atmosphere as well as our environmental conditions. Ozone chemistry is also highly nonlinear. So which means that if we look at the dependence between nitrogen and oxides, and this is not just concentrations here, that also in uh, volatile organic compounds, there are thousands of species out there in the atmosphere, all these very different reactivities. So that's a very complex mixture down here. And ozone is represented, the ozone production and ozone concentrations is represented by these colored lines. So you can see it's a highly nonlinear process and dependent on where on this diagram you are, in which regime you are, your ozone production is either more or less sensitive to VOCs or NOx. So it's really not an easy problem to characterize or to understand. How, where do we find most of the ozone? 
and where do we find ozone in general? So if you look at the global ozone distribution, and this is a nice animation, it's only a few days from a nature run that was done by the NASA GMO uh, office in order to support the development of geostationary satellites. And I would say the color scale is less than ideal here, but what you can see is that you have generally the highest, this is for August, the generally the highest ozone concentrations at the surface in the northern hemisphere, and this is because of all the human activities, because all of the human caused emissions. During summertime, you also have very high ozone here in South of Africa. This is mostly because of biomass burning. Also, really, a large impact is on the northern hemisphere. Um, if you look at this plot, this is from the Tropospheric Ozone Assessment Report. You can see background measurements of surface ozone in Mauna Loa have been going up over the last decades. And this is an effect because of human-caused emissions as well as climate change. So they are continuously going up and kind of you have to think you try and install um, local emission controls, but at the same time you have your background increasing. So you have some counterproductive feedbacks there. In the US, if we think that you know, we are all happy and healthy, uh, not quite. Because if you look at the number of people that live in counties where the air quality concentrations are above what we call the NACs, which is the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, um, you see that about 140 million people live in counties that violate the health standards of one more and more pollutant. And ozone is the pollutant that is our biggest concern in the US. Which of the areas in the US are the most impacted? So this is an area that we call an area of non-attainment areas. So a county that violates the ozone health standards is called, it is in non-attainment. So you see that California, there is many, many counties out of, non out of attainment, East Coast, also in Texas, and here in Denver, we also won the prize. Um, until recently, we were categorized as a moderate violator of the health standards. And I think that was only three weeks ago when we were reclassified, and because we have repeatedly failed to meet the standards, we are now classified as a serious violator, which means by 2021, we have to develop actions that will bring our ozone level down and our area into attainment. So here I give you an example of how ozone in the Colorado Front Range looked over the last decades, going back to the 1990. And what I'm showing you here is for a number of different monitoring sites in the front range, I show you the policy relevant eight hour ozone. And this is defined as the fourth highest daily eight hour maximum averaged over three consecutive years. This is the policy metric that is used to determine if an area is in attainment or non-attainment. It's not the most straightforward metric. I've talked to a lot of policymakers. Um, Everybody tells me there's a very long history behind it, and nobody can tell you anymore what was really the reasoning for this metric. But that's the metric. Um, and what you can see is that specifically since the 2000s, we haven't really managed, despite emission controls, we haven't really managed to bring our ozone levels down significantly. But in contrast, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard in this red dotted line has been reduced. So we are getting ourselves more and more into the problem. So why do we have all these ozone issues here in the front range? First of all, we have a lot of people living here. There's about five million people living in the front range. With that comes a lot of traffic, a lot of urban emissions. Uh, we also have a lot of other diverse sources. We have a lot of oil and gas development going on, specifically the, to the northeast of the Denver metro area. And we also have a lot of other industries going on. We have Commerce City right in the middle of Denver, for example. Many of these sources uh, appear together. They are co-located, but then some of them are also separated, like oil and gas is mostly concentrated outside of the metro area. Um, and the emissions are very difficult to assess because they're high, highly variable. And we have a lot of really small point sources. If you've ever been out to the Weld County area, there is little wells all over the place. And it's really hard to assess their magnitude and their emission flux. In addition to that, we love it here so much because we live right next to the mountains. 
but that really makes our life very complicated in regard to the metrology and in regard to simulating what's happening here. Because we are really experience a very unique mountain-driven local metrology where we have recirculation and a lot of mixing going on. And we have plenty sunshine and very warm summers. So perfect ingredient or perfect conditions to create a lot of ozone. So there's really, a, if you want to understand what's really driving our ozone here, and if you want to develop robust emission control scenarios, we need to really do research. We can't just say, oh, let's maybe try that source, turn it off. There's money involved in it. We need to have very robust scenarios. We need to know what and where are the relevant sources. How do, we trans how do these emissions get transported around? And how do they get chemically processed in the atmosphere? How much pollution comes into Colorado? So how much of the pollution that we have here is out of our control? And what are the best ways that we can really improve our air quality? And this was the motivation behind the front range air pollution for the chemistry experiment, or FRAPE. And FRAPE was funded by the state of Colorado and by NSF. And I had the pleasure, together with Frank, to lead this really big campaign. And it didn't take place by itself. It took together, place together with the NASA Discover EQ, the fourth deployment of this big campaign. And we really treated, they were two separate campaigns, but really treated them as one campaign. We did all the forecasting meetings together, the analyses. So it was really for us one big team. And it took place in the Colorado Front Range in summer 2014. It was probably one of the most comprehensive air quality field campaigns that we've ever conducted. We had in total four aircraft. We had a number of ground-based sources with all different platforms, balloons, sounds, remote sensing instruments, a lot of in-situ instrumentation. And we also had a very strong modeling component associated with it. Just a little bit about the measurement strategies. So the NASA aircraft had actually quite a different objective or strategy compared to the Anchor aircraft, but they were very, very complementary. NASA is really very interested to examine the relationships between remotely sensed columns from satellite and what happens at the surface. You really want to know when you have a satellite product how representative is that of what's happening at the surface where we live, where we really care about things. And the NASA P3, this is the flight pattern for the NASA P3. So they did repeated vertical sampling during cloud-free conditions. You only can, set, can get satellite retrievals during cloud-free conditions. And they're spiraling over six ground super sites. And they were doing that every single time they went out. So it's a really nice data set because we were able to look at the diurnal cycles, evolution of the pollution, evolution of boundary layer, et cetera. Um, then they had two smaller aircraft, the P-200 and the Falcon, and they had remote sensing instrumentation payload, payload to really simulate what a satellite would see and put all these pieces together. The Anchor C-130 was more freely. So depending on the conditions, we followed different objectives. We looked either at local terrain driven uh, upslope, flows and also chemistry. We looked at transport, local emissions, also at the inflow of pollution, some of these legs here. And we also looked at what leaves the front range. What do we basically bring to our downwind neighbors? Um, we also had a large number of ground sites. As I mentioned, we had some fixed ground sites where we had comprehensive measurements. Um, but also remote sensing instruments. We had balloons, ozone sounds as well as tethered balloons, and we had mobile trailers. So they had the comprehensive payload and driving around and looking at flows as well as emission sources. And these are all just the different types of measurements we had. And typically, on operationally, we have in the front range about a dozen monitoring sites that measure ozone. If you're lucky, also some meteorological uh, parameters, otherwise ozone. A little bit of NO2 measurements with questionable NO2 data, and some less than ideal VOC canister samples on an occasional basis. So this was really the first time we got a very, very comprehensive view at what's happening in the front range. So the campaign happened in 2014, right? 
So you plan your campaign, campaign typically two years out. You can't control the weather, so you cross your fingers. How did 2014 look compared to other years? So here what I show you is a climatological view for 2014 compared to 1895 to 2014 timeframe. Here is uh, temperature and here is precipitation. If you look at Colorado, what we see is we had below average temperatures and above average precipitation. We had way more clouds than you would expect. And this, of course, we know we need sunshine in order to start the photochemistry. This, of course, led to 2014 having actually a very low number of days when we exceeded you know, higher ozone concentrations. So basically, the first solution to solving our air quality problem in the front range is conduct an air quality campaign. <laughs> you can be sure you have no more problems. Um, well, we wanted to go a little bit further. We decided that's not satisfying. So nevertheless, if I look here, so as I said, we had above average cloudiness, but if you look at the measurements that were conducted at the operational monitoring sites in the front range during that time period, and this is the daily eight hour maximum surface ozone, you see that there were actually, here is the 70 ppb standard that's now active. Also, you see that there were actually quite a few days where we exceeded that standard already at the monitoring sites. And specifically on many days, it's not very visible on the eight hour average ozone um, plot, but on many days we had a very rapid morning build up of ozone before then at noon time or early afternoon that clouds moved in. So we still had very active photochemistry. It just didn't really translate right into the metrics like that. And there is also a rock in Rocky Mountain National Park, so higher up to the west, there is also a monitor that's run by the EPA. And when you look at, that's in red here, when you look at these data, you see that they track the ozone in the front range overall fairly well. Now, and this is because on most high ozone days, we have upslope for flow conditions. And just to tell you what are the up and down, the mountain valley flows, up and down slope flowing conditions. So during the nighttime, yes, we have the air, the drainage winds that bring the air, the air masses from the mountains down into the lower areas, and specifically along the Platte River Valley and pooling, then the air mass is pooling more in the Weld County area. Now the sun comes up, the slopes are heating up, we start developing uh, upsloping flows. So our flows reverse, and now we start bringing up the air from the front range slowly up into the mountains and to the higher altitudes. And with the air that we are moving up during the day up into the mountains, we are bringing up all the pollution and start also impacting the mountain areas to the west. Uh, upslope flows typically start near the foothills and then they start from there spreading to the east and west. And it's typically, I mean, typically they start around 9 to 10 o'clock in the morning on most of the days during the campaign. So the upslope flows, flows are very characteristic for high ozone days, and they really determine where we transport our pollution around. So, but now let's go back to, we need to create the pollution first, right? So this is a picture of the non-attainment area, and we could talk long about why a non-attainment area cuts right through counties. I'm not sure, it's an interesting topic, but not for today. Um, so here is our area. So how do we look with regard to emission sources? So I mentioned earlier we have a lot of diverse sources. We have oil and gas development, mostly to the northeast of the Denver area. Traffic emissions and urban emissions are very concentrated in the Denver area, but really spread all across the front range, and we have also quite a significant number of industrial emissions, which are more concentrated in the Denver area, actually. If we look just at the emission magnitude, so here is now for NOx emissions per county, just the magnitude represented by the size of a circle. And what we can see is Weld is actually, Weld County has quite a bit of NOx emissions, and then definitely also in the Denver area, because NOx comes a lot from traffic and human uh, and industrial sources also. Um, this is actually a little bit misleading, this circle here, 
because what we have to consider is here is that oil and gas emissions have a very, so this is the total emission strength, the annual emissions here, day and night. During the photochemically active time of the day, it's actually Weld County, the circle would be smaller because Weld County has a rather flat diurnal cycle in their emissions. Versus if you look at many of the urban traffic sources, they peak during the daytime. At night, people sleep, they don't drive. So it's a little bit misleading, but there is still, point is that there is a lot of emissions in the Denver area of Knox, and there's definitely also a significant amount in Weld County. And VOCs, volatile organic compounds, Oil and gas activities emit a lot of volatile organic compounds, and there is definitely Walt County is by far dominating as a source for volatile organic compounds. And we see that also reflected in the measurements. So here are measurements from the NCAR C-130 aircraft, assaying concentrations here, and NOx concentrations shown here. This is Boulder, the pretty pink dot here. What you can see is that really, ethane, I take that at the moment as a representative for VOCs from oil and gas emissions, is very much concentrated in, to the northeast of the Denver area, in the Weld County area, versus Knox, you see that very concentrated in the Denver area. And what you can also see is that transport with the upslope flows that brings these air masses away from the emission sources towards the west. We can also take a remote sensing view of the emissions, and this is from the NASA GeoTASO instrument that was also flown during the Frappe campaign. It is a precursor instrument for the geostationary temple satellite mission, so this is really data that we will be able to get when temple is being launched in 2022. So what you see in the morning, you see this emission hotspot of the NO2 total column, which is really dominated by NO2 surface concentrations uh, in the Denver area. And then you see later in the afternoon, you still see this hotspot near Denver, but you see also how the upslope flow has started moving these emissions towards the west. So um, there is a lot of different emission inventories out there, and you can spend a lot of time looking at them. So what I'm showing you here is four different inventories. Three of them, the EPA inventories, are provided by the US EPA. And in this kind of orangey type like are the a priori emissions that we have put together during Frappe. And I show you here the emission magnitude for NOx and for VOCs for the different counties. So Weld County with most of the oil and gas. You can see that there is quite a bit of difference in the magnitude of these uh, different inventories, but overall they represent the county to county differences also fairly well. Now with Frappe, we were in a unique position and not just, you know, in an operational setting, you have now your ozone monitors. You can't really evaluate emission inventories by just having ozone measurements, doesn't work. Frappe, we were in a unique position that we had a very comprehensive set of measurements that we could put some commission constraints on here. And we run, so basically in a very nutshell is, we run the model with our a priori emissions, and then we evaluate it very carefully with aircraft data. But an important aspect is we only use data when our modeled and our observed winds come from about the same sector, so that we really compare the same air masses. We don't want to evaluate one air mass, you know, when the model simulates an air mass, it comes from here, and the aircraft says it comes from there. Doesn't tell you anything. Um, we also separate the air masses based on their chemical signature. So what is more dominated by oil and gas, what's more dominated by traffic emissions. We look also not just at absolute values, but also at tracer-tracer ratios, which is very important uh, to evaluate emission ratios. And then we run numerous iterations and come up with a final scaling. And with that, the final results we came up was that our oil and gas emissions were significantly underestimated. So we had to double the oil and gas emissions to get a reasonable agreement with the aircraft data. We also found that outside of the Denver, in the Denver area, the traffic emissions seemed to be fairly good. Outside of the Denver area, they were significantly underestimated. So we had to double them. And then we also had to double SIN, but SIN isn't that relevant for the ozone production, so that's of not that big an issue here. 
So having now a fairly high confidence in our emission constraints, we put those into the model and decided now we can look at source contributions. So there is a lot of other model evaluation going on here that I'm not showing. So what we did is we put this emission inventory into our model, run it for the entire frappe time period, and I'm plotting here the daily eight, the average daily eight hour ozone for the frappe period. And so Boulder is again by this little star here as a reference. And you see that on an average for the entire campaign, the highest ozone was about in the Denver area, but again, you see here this shift of the high ozone towards the best, representing the upslope flows. And so now, having this set up, we started turning on and off different emission sources to look at their contribution. So we did a zero out approach. In the first step, we turned off all the anthropogenic emissions in the front range. So, okay, no more humans here. How would our ozone look? And the difference gives us the contribution from all the anthropogenic emissions in the front source, uh, front range. And you can see that this is on average, we reach about 15 to 20 ppb, which is when you think about ozone concentrations of 70 to 80 ppb, that's a significant amount, especially if our background is in the order of 50 to 55 ppb. And on the high ozone days, that reached 20 to 30 ppb, and the maximum was reached uh, on 28th of July with up to 40 ppb. So these results are very clearly indicating us that it's the local emissions that are the major contributor on high ozone day. In contrast to discussions before Frappe where actually a lot of finger pointing was tried to be made to, it's coming out from us, it's coming from the outside. We are not doing anything here. So this was very clear result to us it's really all the sources that we have in the front range that we need to take into consideration. We also looked at individual emission sectors. Here I show you the contribution if we would, uh, from the oil and gas sector. Here the contribution from traffic emissions, industrial contribution, so this would be airports, refineries, etc. And CEM are continuous emission monitoring sources, mostly power plants. And when you look at these contributions, you can see industrial and CEM contribute locally, but the largest contributions are really from oil and gas, mostly impacting the northern part of the front range and from traffic sources, which is a little bit shifted to the south, but really all across the front range. So we really can conclude it's local, local emissions as well, and from these local emissions, it's predominantly the oil and gas and the traffic emissions that are our biggest problems. Now these are very policy relevant results. And if you give those to policymakers, you know, if, if you give them the wrong information, that might cost money. So you want to be really sure about the information you give them. So we decided also to do a very independent evaluation of our conclusions. And for this, we actually rely most exclusively just on measurements. So we take two different chemical box models, the box marks and the NASA Langley steady state model. And we constrain these models by the comprehensive set of C130 observations. And then we perform, we again take samples that are representative for different air masses, some that's more impacted by oil and gas, the other more by traffic, and then perform again zero out scenarios. And just as a little example how that works is, here I take an aircraft sample from Weld County that had very, very typical, typical signatures for oil and gas emissions. This is the result for box marks. So I take that aircraft sample, I run it through my box model and look at the ozone produced. And in the first step, what we do is we run it these two different chemical mechanisms. One is the full explicit master chemical me mechanism with thousands of species. The other one is the Mozart chemical mechanism, the one that we have in our chemical transport models. And you can see that, well, they are not one-to-one -one because here we have, I'm not sure, 150 species and here we have a few thousand species, but they are doing very well. So our lamp mechanism does actually a fairly good job. And then we play the game and say, let's turn off the oil and gas emissions. And then we see that in this case, for this specific sample, we get a quite a significant reduction of 14 ppb in our ozone. 
And the steady state model does something very similar, except that it looks at the ozone production, but it estimates that about 80% of the ozone production in Belt County comes from oil and gas. So that's a rather independent evaluation that we conducted that helps us to confirm the robustness of our conclusions that we give to policymakers. Now we can also go a step further and I mentioned, you know, so far I've used VOCs as one term. I put all the different species into this one category. But there is a lot of VOC compounds out there and it's actually um, really important information for policymakers to let them know what is the role of individual VOCs because they could provide also cost-effective policies to reduce ozone. And this is what uh, we have done in one of our recent papers. And I've been making use of WolfCam, and specifically I've been making use of two diagnostics that uh, we have been implementing. The one is the integrated re reaction rate analysis, which gives us a 3D output of all the individual gas phase reaction rates that we can then post-process and post-analyze and also of the chemical tendencies. So that's basically chemical tendencies is nothing else than think about it as the difference in concentrations before or after a certain process is called in the model. That can be the chemistry, that can be the attraction, that can be the mixing. But it's really powerful diagnostic tools. And in my study, I only focused on one day, on the 12th of August, and you see an um, animation of these days with the monitoring sites as the dots, and otherwise it's the model fields. And you can see it was a very strong upslope flow. And on this day, the model performed uh, quite well, actually. And we also had a C-130 flight on that day that very well characterized first the emissions in the morning and then the upslope flow. And so I picked this day as my case study since it was, first of all, a very typical ozone day, and also my model did really well on that day. I'm not going to show much evaluation, but at least I had to put in one slide. Um, so first of all, there are certain model uncertainties you are just not able to overcome. So in order to address this, I ran a set of different models with different emission inventories, also with different configurations, which changes the metrology slightly. And so these are all represented by different lines. And in the model performance, you know, they all perform somewhat differently, but it's really not, you cannot clearly say one is much worse than the other. They all do actually a fairly reasonable change, uh, Reason, reasonable job, and specifically if you look at not only absolute values, but ratios, and specifically also at metrics that let me evaluate if my model gets the chemistry also right, the underlying fundamentals. And if you're interested, I'm happy to talk more offline to you about it, or you can read my paper, there is more about it in there. Here I really want to only talk about the analyses. The chemical analyses, I'm focusing now here on four different regions. On an oil and gas region that is mostly dominated by the oil and gas emissions, a region that's over the Denver metro area called city, and then I have two regions that are in the foothills. And this color scaling I'll keep throughout the plot. So keep in mind, city is red, oil and gas is black, and then green and blue are the foothills regions. Before I show you any chemistry, I show you the boundary layer because boundary layer is really crucial in determining our surface concentrations. And so here I show you for this day, the modeled boundary layer, the average over these four regions. And what you can see is that in the city, we have the highest boundary layer, most of the mixing going on. And that can be expected because the city will heat up the most. It has an urban heat island effect. Contrary to that, we see in the oil and gas is actually a rather a more shallow boundary layer. And what you see here is also that it's very much slower rising in the morning. And this has the implication that actually in the oil and gas region, my emissions will remain more concentrated for longer. So I will actually have a more powerful mix remains there for cooking the ozone. NOx is one of the ozone precursors, so this is how the different NOx concentrations look like. Keep in mind, NOx concentrations at the surface are determined by the emissions, also by the thermal cycle in emissions and the magnitude. 
um, and by the boundary layer, and of course by the chemistry and the transport. So CD emissions, because we have in the morning the highest emissions because of the rush hour, and still a very low boundary layer, this is why our NOx peaks early morning. Our Oil and gas emissions, remember I mentioned earlier, the diurnal cycle of oil and gas emissions is much more flat over the course of a day. So that's why they peak at night when the boundary layer is the most shallow. And the highest NOx we find in the city, which reflects already what I showed earlier in the measurements. The VOC mixing ratio, sorry my oil and gas is cut off here, but what you can see is the diurnal cycle is very similar to NOx and now we see also, as we've seen earlier already, the VOCs are definitely the highest in our oil and gas area. How does that now translate into ozone? Here is the diurnal cycles for surface ozone concentrations for these four regions. And what you can see is in the oil and gas region, we have a much sharper and higher peak in ozone concentrations compared to the city that has a much more broader peak. And in the foothills region, the peak in surface ozone concentrations is reached later in the day. Now this, sorry, this plot, surface ozone in general, is not only impacted by chemistry, it's also impacted by transport. So we can also look at just the chemical production. And here I'm showing the net chemical ozone production for these four regions. And what you can see is for the oil and gas emission, uh, oil and gas region, we have first of all the highest production, it reaches the highest instantaneous values as well as if we integrate the production over the course of the daytime, you reach the highest total production of 30 to 40 ppb. In the city, we reach about 15 to 30 ppb, which is a much broader production curve. And what's really interesting is that if you look at the chemical production in the foothills region, away from the sources, you still get about 15 up to 25 ppb of chemical ozone production. So what that tells you is that while you're bringing the air masses from the front range up into the mountains, they're still very powerful, they still keep cooking, and they still have the potential of making quite a bit of additional ozone while they are being transported into the mountains. Uh, the other also, if you compare the peak in surface ozone at the foothill sites, was later in the day, but the production at the foothill sites peaks actually in the middle of the day. So that really tells you that it's an interplay between transport of ozone pollution as well as local production that dominates ozone concentrations in the foothills. Now it's not just relevant to look at what are the VOC concentrations, but we want to look at how powerful are the VOCs in making ozone. And this is why we look at the OH plus VOC reactivity here. And when we look at that, so how powerful are the VOCs in initiating this initial step to create ozone, you see that it's highest in the oil and gas region, followed by the city, and then there is still quite a significant reactivity also in the foothills region. We can relates this then also to the NOx reactivity. And this is shown here as the dotted line. And it's maybe a little bit, you know, there's many lines here, but we can see if, if we look at the NOx uh, reactivity, we see that is highest for the city regions, and then it's for the oil and gas and the foothills region. But what's really of interest to us is to look at the ratio of these two. So look at the OH plus VOC versus the OH plus NOx reactivity. And these are in the range of it's the lowest for the, for the city and higher for the other regions. And what this ratio tells us is which process, which chemical reaction it is that terminates our ozone production cycle. And depending on this ratio, what we can include is that the lower ratio means you're closer to a VOC limited regime, which means your ozone production is sensitive to VOCs, versus the other regimes, the oil and gas and the foothills regions, are more sensitive to NOx. So if we go back to the plot that I showed earlier, where we have the NOx and the volatile organic compounds and the ozone concentrations and saying, here it's more sensitive, if you move it here, you're more sensitive to VOCs, here you're more sensitive to NOx, 
and they put our regions on here, you see that in the city, we are in an area that is way more responsive to VOC controls versus in the other regions, we are sensitive to an, in, in an area that is sensitive more to NOx controls. So I just need to get a quick sip of water. So this is important information, and now we can go a step further. Because what's also interesting is, it's not just kind of, okay, we have now more powerful VOC there, it's good, we create more ozone. But what are these VOC? Which, which species are really the most powerful? Since we said, you know, there is thousands of species out there. So which are the most powerful volatile organic compounds? And this is what we actually can do also in our model. So we take our diagnostics and we dig deeper and we rank the importance of the different VOCs based on their role on ozone production for these four regions, oil and gas, city, and the foothills regions. Now keep in mind, this ranking changes. So the color scale changes for the four different regions. Number one, so the two most important that for all the regions explain about half of the reactivity of the VOCs is CO, carbon monoxide, and formaldehyde. In the oil and gas region, it's the higher alkanes which are emitted from oil and gas sources, which are the number three VOC contributor. And in the other regions, it's isoprene, which comes mostly from biogenic sources. So the trees that we have in the Denver area are actually quite powerful. And then it's also acetaldehyde is then the number four, or uh, number five in all of the, no, oh, it's number four, sorry. <laughs> it's number four in all of the regions. So um, I was interested in looking a little bit more into formaldehyde because formaldehyde has direct sources as well as secondary uh, production. So in order to determine how important are direct sources versus secondary production, I did a sensitivity run where I simply turned off the formaldehyde emissions. And when you do that, you see that your formaldehyde doesn't change very much. And the impact on ozone was also very little. So it's actually really all the secondary ozone formation, uh, the secondary formaldehyde formation. So now we need to know, well, where does the formaldehyde come from? What are the precursor emissions for formaldehyde? And I don't expect you to read all that, but how we do that in a model is we look at our formaldehyde, we look at the precursors to formaldehyde. If the precursors are direct emissions, well, we can stop here. If the precursors are not direct emissions, we go a step further back, we go a step further back, until we can explain at least 80, around 80% 80 of the formaldehyde budget. And if we do that, we see that some of the major contributors to producing formaldehyde in the front range are methane, propene, the higher alkanes, and isoprene. And so this is really now important information because now we say, hey, you know, these are also, you need to put more focus on these emission VOCs. Can you find different VOCs? Try to really control these. Methane was something that really interested me because methane in air quality models today is not considered explicitly. It's treated as a lower boundary condition. So you give it prescribed concentrations and this is what you have. Now if you go out into the field, we measured concentrations that are way above the background. So what I did is I modified the model to basically have in our, in our front range concentrations that more reflected what we measured. So I, we have increased my methane basically. And when you do that, you can see that your ozone concentrations, it's not a huge impact, but they can change ozone by about well, up to one PBB, specifically downhill. So it's actually, in, in air quality, we typically don't really pay attention to methane, but it's maybe something that we should start putting a little bit more attention to, that it, it's not only relevant on climate scales, it can also be relevant on air quality scales. And I did a similar with CO. CO um, largely is from background CO, but there is also local emissions. CO doesn't get much attention in air quality policy control making anymore either. But I did something very similar, but in here now, I turned off all the local CO emissions, and then we reach 
kind of background concentrations for CO in the model. And then we can see that ozone changes when we do that by about 2 ppb, by up to 2 ppb. Again, most effect is in the down, uh, a little bit further away from the emission sources because both CO and methane have a rather long lifetime. So both species haven't gotten really much attention in air quality policy making, but maybe we should not totally ignore them. So I'm... Um, Better move on. So let me just summarize for P with a very, very brief summary. Here are again our questions. What and where are the relevant sources? It's local emissions with the largest impact from oil and gas and mobile sources. How do these emissions get transported? Well, it's mostly upslope flows that are the dominant patterns on high ozone days. And that really has implications in that we bring our pollution quite effectively into the mountains. How do they get chemically processed? Well, we have a very highly reactive VOC mix and we have a high abundance of NOx, and I think I've shown that to you. How much pollution comes into Colorado? I'm not addressing that much here, but you have seen that we turn off all the anthropogenic emissions is a huge contribution. Most of our excess ozone in the front range is really from local sources. And what are the best ways? Well, focus really on the major emission sources, oil and gas and mobile. Focus on the precursor species to formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is one of the very powerful ingredients for ozone formation. And there is some benefits of looking also at methane and CO reductions. So with RP, we have really been able to address a lot of the questions. And it's actually been also brought up a few more questions. And it has given also a little bit of guidance where should air quality research move ahead? And some of the major areas where I see that we really as a field need to move ahead to is, first of all, what we've really realized is our chemical mechanisms are really good, but they are not yet good enough. There is still a lot, uh, specifically in regards to VOCs, organic nitrates, and others, that we just don't represent quite well in our models yet. That's a nice study where Rebecca Schwantes, so I'm not sure if Rebecca is here, but yes, here she is, and she adds about one or two species every day to our chemical mechanism, just to better represent what's really going on there. But it's really important. If we don't get our chemistry in the model right, how can we really um, gain confidence? The other is that often you hear that, ah, oh, ozone, we know everything about it. It's not a problem. We understand everything. By far not. I'm not aware that we have ever reached the full closure on the ozone budget. On, on none, none of the scales, not local, not global. There is still too large uncertainties for that. One of those is, for example, dry deposition, and I know that Olivia is here, that is from one of her recent papers. Dry deposition, we still don't understand it fully, and it's an important sink for ozone. So our budget isn't right if we don't get the sinks right. There has also been a uh, lot of attention now to new sources, sources that are not in any of our inventories, such as cannabis industry or personal care products. So we need to really work on getting those into our emission inventories, into our models, and into our chemical mechanisms. Doesn't mean that our chemical mechanisms have evolved for very typical urban sources, for very typical maybe you know, natural emissions. The chemistry for these might be very different. So we have to really put more research into that. Um, we also have to uh, keep in mind and get ready for, we have to keep in mind that we have these field campaigns. We use them, we need to use them really to advance our fundamental understanding because to really understand a region, they're often giving us only a snapshot in time. This is important to characterize a region. And sometimes we should also think about maybe going back to again to the same region where we have done already a lot of research, where we have gotten a good understanding, and then be able to build upon that and not always hop from one region to the other and start again new. And we also need to get ready for all the upcoming new measurements that will be available. And I just show here one is an example. So I'm on the Tempo Early Adopter Science team. And this is just with the Tempo is the next generation geostationary air quality satellites that we will have. And it will provide us hourly data of NO2, ozone, and some other species over the US. 
at you know, a few kilometer resolution. So that's really something, it's, it's going to be exciting when we have these data sets. And one thing that's dear and near to my heart is this inconsistency that to date we are still dealing with our different models. We have global models to look at the large scale, we have regional models, we have local models. This is an example of how we run typically at the moment the regional model. We have the regional model, and then we take boundary conditions from the global model, and then we run that. But you can see how we have this inconsistency here. And you know, don't get me wrong, when I started on the regional scale, this out here wasn't even moving. You said idealized boundary conditions. Ozone is 40 ppb everywhere. And then you run that. So that was state of the art, but that was state of the art a few years ago. And that does not satisfy our needs anymore. Specifically now that we know that the scales are really connected. And this is where the excitement comes in. And this is where you know, I wanted to bring up Musica, the development of the multi-scale infrastructure for chemistry and aerosols. Because I think it's really a fully exciting time to be a modeler, but also to be a measurement person and be able to have tools like that that are unified and bring all the scales together in a very modular framework. A way where we finally can consistently resolve local, regional, and global scale and do that within an entire Earth system framework. Musica is well on its way of being developed and there is a big team that's behind it and it's really devoted to its development. Um, Musica version zero is close to being finalized and a lot of work is done also by Pachuantes and by Forrest Lacey and I'm not sure if Simone is in the room here. Musica V0 is basically the chem -chem, the global ChemCam -chem model with the spectral element core, with regional refinement over any region. Here I just show you the US, US, and when you compare the regional refinement to the one degree, you can see that not only over the regional refinement area you have differences, but also outside of it. So it's really important that we are able to consistently resolve them and not have some fake boundaries and boundary effects there. And having tools like that available, having this suite of geostationary satellites, having new instrumentation available, many more capabilities, I think now it's really exciting that we can go to the really small scale and look at what's really relevant. And what I think and I like to see developing at Anchor is really a program that focuses specifically on urban air quality. Well, why? If you look at projections, more than half the world's population is already living in cities, and that's only to grow. I mean, Den Denver is one of them. If you've been to Denver, it's growing incredibly. So we need to really, and what is it? Cities are the area where you have most of the emissions, and cities is where most of the people live. That's where people are exposed to air pollution. So we need to really focus on understanding, characterizing, and simulating the high resolution dynamical, physical, and chemical processes in urban, urban areas. LES with interactive chemistry, oops, it's challenging, but you know, challenges are there to be mastered. And then when we understand what's going on there, we can also look in these unified systems, how these urban areas are impacted by and affect regional to global scales. We can really get a full closure in a consistent framework. And once we characterize and understand all that, then we can really work on this policy and societal relevant information on study how cities evolve on the future economic, but also social development and on our climate change. And one aspect that I see also that I want to definitely get more into is exploring the co-benefits of climate and air quality mitigation. My work has shown me a little bit that, well, you know, methane's not only important on climate scale, it's important also on air quality scales. Think about a carbon fee and dividend. That's not only impacting your greenhouse gases, it's also impacting your pollution emissions. So that's why I think it's really, really exciting. And in order to make progress, and that's where I end, and I'm sorry, probably I'm already too long, is in order to make progress, 
you just need to have the right people, you need to collaborate, and you need to have a fantastic team. And I think for Frappé, I couldn't have wished for a more fantastic team. And I apologize if there's anybody who I forgot, but I want to thank everybody who made the campaign a total success. And thank you for coming and listening. Thank you very much, Gabby. Thank you very much, Gabby. I think we'll have to go through a number of questions by using the microphone, because uh, this uh, uh, presentation is broadcast. So I'm going to ask who would like to ask the first question. David. Thank you. That was a very nice talk. Um, can you, you never mentioned uh, one of the other goals of looking at frappe emissions, which was look at the agricultural emissions and the feedlots and all the mix of those emissions and how they contribute. Can you comment on that, please? Yes, definitely. So why I didn't focus specifically on the agricultural emissions, because in the to ozone, we pay less attention to them, although they also give you know, nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide emissions come from, or nitrogen emissions come from uh, oil and gas, uh, from agricultural feedlots, and methane also. But what they, are mostly what they are mostly of relevance for the front range is, of course, the methane, because we need to understand for climate impacts, we need to understand if we regulate oil and gas versus uh, agricultural emissions, who is really a bigger contributor to methane, but also for uh, nitrogen and ammonia transport. And specifically, we have seen we have a lot of upslope flows, so you have a lot of ammonia coming out from agricultural activities, and they are being brought up into the mountains, and that's where all the nitrogen get, get, gets deposited in lakes and also in soils and impacts really the ecosystem. You run into over-fertilizing problems in these regions that just cannot handle the nitrogen loading. So I haven't touched on that because my talk was really focused on ozone, but it was one of the important aspects that was addressed also during Frappé. Other questions? And maybe just an interesting next side effect. There is about even more cows living in the front range than people. Just an interesting little fact. Really interesting stuff. Um, and you pointed to a lot of potential you know, issues to focus on in terms of potentially reducing um, some pollution. What, what about the air quality managers and their perspective in this? I mean, you know, it's been identified now as a serious uh, polluter, pollution area, um, and wh what are they going to focus on, and how do, you, how do we sort of mm -hmm. um, best interact with them and yeah. focusing on the right things? Yeah, and so first of all, um, I maybe didn't bring up that point very highly. So um, CDPHE is the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and they were really core partners of the campaign. They were there from the design phase through the conduction, through the analysis phase, and we still collaborate with them. So I think having them be part of the team, that was the first very important, because this way they also develop trust in the results and they develop trust in you. You are not going out there to the research and then giving it. They are part of the team. Um, that's the first important part. Um, one thing that I liked, that I really liked how things changed before and after Frappé, and I was thinking you know, about that specifically now that we have a few papers out. Um, before Frappé, we had, Frank and I also attended a lot of the meetings there on the Regional Air Quality Council. There was a lot of discussion, it's China, it's coming from California, it's coming from there. Everything was the focus was go away from the front range. I haven't really heard that lately anymore. It's kind of, I think it's become a fact now that it's really our local sources. So I think Frappé has really contributed significantly to put back our attention to our local emission sources. And as I said, we still collaborate with uh, CDPHE. 
they are, you know, I, I see they fully understand the results. They use them also in developing the state implement, implementation plan. They're working also with our constrained emission inventory. They use our data to evaluate their models now. But they are unfortunately, what can be for researchers sometimes frustrating is, they are also limited by politics. So, you know, you talk to the people who really develop the scenarios, they understand the problem, but what they are allowed to move forward with can maybe be less satisfying for us researchers. Doesn't mean that we have to stop pushing. Sorry. Frank. I to make one comment to that. We just recently had a meeting with uh, Stephen Fenberg, who is the uh, uh, Senate Majority Leader in, in the Colorado Senate. Uh, and uh, there is some movement now uh, with the Polis administration uh, pushing to address climate, uh, to address air pollution and climate change at the same time. Uh, and it was suggested uh, that they asked us for input together with you know some CU colleagues and NOAA colleagues, and uh, we all met at uh, at uh, the SEC here with him. Um, and he has just recently introduced a bill that will make available a research fund that people can apply to to uh, solve local air quality problems. And they will come up with questions that we'll probably have in input to uh, that then people can uh, apply similarly to what is happening in Texas and in, in California with the CARB and the TCEQ. Uh, so I, I think there's, you know, some progress. You know. Other question. Uh, thanks, Gabby. Um, another anomaly in 2014 was the near complete lack of smoke. Uh, have you thought about how that affects the external influence as well as ozone, ozone production in yes. the region? Yes. And so it was nearly as much lack of smoke as in 2019 during Fire XAQ, right? <laughs> Actually, um, we were quite happy about that because smoke and wildfires. It is, a day, it is an occurrence that we have to live here. We know it's impacting our equality. But it's way harder to control. So if you really want to develop or give recommendations of saying, how can we mitigate our ozone pollution problem? If you have now the area all covered in wildfire smoke, you're, it's very hard to distinguish that signal from the signal that comes just from controllable sources, that's the anthropogenic sources. So we were, in that regard, the clouds and the rain that we had, we were actually really, really lucky that we did not complicate our problem by having an additional wildfire source that covers and blankets everything and makes it really hard to separate what is due to what but get a rather clean cut case that could allow us to focus really on the anthropogenic part of the pollution. So, and we have in 2018 and in 2019, we have the weekend and the fire execute campaigns to specifically look at that source and add that to complete the picture. Yes, I have two questions. One is meteorological and uh, you pointed out the importance of the, the land uh, temperature differences, you know, out on the plains versus mm -hmm. the mountains, and the, 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 yeah. uh, those winds. To, okay, one related to that is, is this typically under, say, low to moderate wind conditions? Yeah. Okay, and which is consistent with everything else that occurs in other cities too, right? And the other thing is, does the Denver cyclone, is that part of this whole thing? Because it's been well known for a long time. You've got this big recirculation eddy and, or vortex in, yeah. you know, in this region. And I assume that what would happen is that these upslope downslope flows just uh, amplify or, or modify that cycle. Yeah. And I would have, you know, in the interest of time, and I think it was already very long, I didn't have time to go into the Denver cyclone because I think that was, we had three days during the campaign when we experienced the Denver cyclone. And actually one of the days, I'm not sure, you probably don't remember, 22nd of July was also one of the high ozone days, and the 27th, the 27th we had the strongest cyclone, where you have in the morning you develop the cyclone, and that 
really is a very powerful way of mixing the pollutions and keeping them in the area. When you flew, it was really amazing. When you flew with the aircraft through the Denver Cyclone, and let's say you looked at essaying concentrations. You were outside the Denver Cyclone, you had kind of background concentrations. And it was within a few seconds you enter the cyclone, the concentrations shoot up extremely high within the cyclone, you exit the cyclone, and you go back to back concentrations. It's a very concentrated circulation that keeps the emissions then. And, that, and then, you know, it kind of later in the morning, early afternoon, it breaks apart, and the upslope flow started dominating. So you had basically everything. This really concentrated cooking of the pollution and keeping the emissions and circulating them around in the morning, and then later on with the upslope flows. So it's, it's a totally interesting phenomenon. And, and a second question is unrelated to that, but it's, it has to do with uh, fine aerosols, PM2.5. You didn't mention that. And I wondered if you did make any measurements of PM2.5, because you know that it, in combination with ozone, is very synergistic. This fine aerosol is yeah. very important for human health. Yeah. There, are, there have been some measurements of PM2.5. There's also been some studies on looking into the composition of the aerosols. But the concentrations in the front range outside of wildfire episodes are very, very low. For PM2.5? For PM2.5, yeah. If we are typically PM2.5 in the front range is a problem when we have wildfire influence or in winter time when we have the inversion layers. So you have seen probably this winter we had actually more than normal alerts of PM2.5 exceedances. So, but typically it's a wintertime problem when we have heat, urban heating and when we have the inversions. Because a lot of that PM2.5, of course, is related to the chemistry, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cooker, yes. Said, and also yes, aerosol. yes, definitely. It's just this focus was much more on ozone because okay. it's from a health, from a violation point of view and just typically, the concentrations of PM2.5 are just not that high. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, Gabby. Uh, I keep hearing this language about robust measures towards the oil and gas industry. Now we have the information. You even pinpointed what compounds leading to a higher contribution of ozone pollution. I was wondering, can you s specify a little bit more on the what kind of robust measures are we talking about? Um, robust measures is, I think, you mean uh, policy measures? What the? I think when you looked at the speciation and all the measurements that we have, first of all, came to mind is 2014. A few things have happened since then already. One thing in 2014, we did measurements near waste ponds, basically, where they dump all the waste water from the fracking operations. These were basically, think about it like just an open tank, put the water in there. I mean, we measured values of 120 ppb of benzene next to them. That's, I mean, thinking that the safe level is somewhere below 1 ppb is kind of, yeah, that's maybe a concern, I would say. So these are things that, for example, don't exist anymore. You know, some of these things were taken away. Um, parts also because there were measurements about it. Um, there is a lot where you see just not then not the standard control quality procedures that are being done. A lot of these emissions come from just wells that are not operated ideally. And I think there is way more permitting and controlling needs to go on in order that drilling activities and fracking activities really fulfill the requirements. There is just no, no real, and that's where there is a lot of discussions now also going on. You need to be able to control that better, what's going on out there. You cannot rely on people just, as I said, a lot of the measurements has shown that much of what we see in the atmosphere is just from dirty and not well operated wells. And that's, I think, where we need to put our focus. <coughs> OK, let me ask you a last question. Uh, going a bit beyond Frappe, there is air pollution in many parts of the world, and the world is changing. So the Chinese are trying to clean up their air pollution. But a continent now that is getting uh, more and more 
important in terms of air pollution is Africa. Yep. Africa has a tremendous change of growth in, in air pollution. And we have very few observations there. We have very little way of doing field measurements or uh, getting uh, on the ground there for comprehensive studies. So if uh, suddenly you were kind of interested in a continent where urban development is enormous, economic growth is mild, but air pollution is uh, large. How would you address this problem? Like you said, first of all, it's really hard to bring, I mean, you're not likely bringing any aircraft to Africa. There is a lot of issues. So, but there is other ways, like I always think when I think about the problem like that, I think about VOC canisters. VOCs are canisters bringing them into a region should be fairly straightforward, even on United maybe. Um, and they, VOC signatures are very, very powerful in telling you chemical footprints and about sources. On the other hand, we don't need to think only about the ground. Like we are talking about, I'm not sure I have this vision there, but at the moment we talk about the suite of geostationary, geostationary satellites for air quality that are going over North America, over Europe, and over Asia. Beautiful, we have the Northern Hemisphere covered. What stops us really putting up a geos, I look now at David, putting up a geostationary satellite over Africa? I'm not sure, wouldn't that be something fantastic to pursue? But this is just something to maybe consider. We have the capability. It will be achieved in the Northern Hemisphere. And it is something that gives us a continuous monitoring, not only of the current situation, but also of the, of the changes in time. OK. Thank you very much to Gabby for Thank this you. energetic and comprehensive presentation. I think we all enjoyed it very much. And uh, let's uh, thank Gabby for her presentation. Thanks, everybody.